We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, to absolutely, to true because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome to our Really Radio Show 133, recorded Friday, November 18th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your entertainment through mostly rational conversations that'll make you go, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I have my usual suspects. I've got Fred Sims right there. I've got uh, this way. No, that way. <laughs> I've got Daniel Atherton and Steve McGurtha. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome, welcome. And uh, I believe we'll have Amber next week, possibly, depending on uh, on schedules. And, and Black uh, Friday. And who, oh, it will be Black Friday, won't it? Oh, whether, we survive, whether we survive Black Friday. Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Well, I'm planning to have a show. So there you go. <laughs> so you'll, you'll get to get to join us on uh, what is it? Um, Local Monday or no, it's um, Cyber Monday. No, there's Cyber Monday, but I think um, American small Express. Small Business Saturday. Yeah. Small Business Saturday. American Express decided to, uh, you know, put put their weight behind that. Not that small businesses really take American Express. You ever notice that? Yeah, it costs yeah. too much. Yeah, it costs and, too much. And it's the too fact much that pro it's, consumer. So. Well, yeah, I was going to say it's really detrimental because American Express has a policy that if you have one of their cards and you dispute a charge, they'll take that charge away pretty much no questions asked. Yep. Kind of hurts small business if you do that. So You're speaking into the top of the microphone, and that is a side capturing microphone. No, tell people to stop messing with it. I, I would, but I think you're the one that messed with it. I don't know. Not me. Okay. Well, see, that's so much better. Oh, yeah, my I gosh. Didn't, I didn't do it. Ah, so much better. Okay, there we go. All right. I'm in technical difficulties out of the way. Okay. So, hey. Audience Hold feed- on. No, before we even get to audience feedback. Okay, is. I didn't get to be on the show since the day the earth stood still. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> So fuck. And there's our explicit tag. All righty. Right. Very good. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, in case you've been living under a rock uh, for November. Uh, yeah, we have President-elect Trump. Who we will discuss, you know, again at length at because he's length. impossible to avoid. He's... But yeah, I, it, I missed yeah. last week's show and, and everybody got their, their say in their piece and I did not. So I had to get that in there. Just a little bit. Um, for those of you that do know me on Facebook or follow me, there is a post. You can go back and find it. It's phenomenal. Enjoy. <laughs> well, uh, Trump is in all of the news all of the time because that's how he let, – let's be honest. That's how he won, by being in the news all the time, um, that and not being Hillary. So we're never going to be rid of him, at least not for the foreseeable future. I, I, again, two years is what I'm given at this point. We'll see beyond that. I don't know. He's slippery. He's I mean, not so even, slippery. Not even then. I, I yeah. saw something, had the thought the other day. There will be a library named after this man at some point in the future. And it, it will be, be solid gold. Nothing but tax returns. Um. <laughs> the tax return library. <laughs> nice. Uh, but he won't. he won't release those still, I don't think. Anyway. No, not until he has, you know, permanent uh, Secret Service coverage <laughs> and that wonderful pension. Welcome, Mama Van. Uh, <laughs> well, no, no longer will have permanent. It's 10 years. Uh, Mama oh, Van came in. They did change that a uh, couple of administrations ago. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm sure she knew exactly what it was in reference to, though, too. So I'm I'm sure. Well, especially as we continue to chat about uh, about it. Yes. So it's one of those things. Okay, so uh, feedback from uh, previous shows. Um, there wasn't any, so well, shame on you. I'm sure that we screwed up somewhere. So please, uh, you know, send us your thoughts and comments and concerns, and of course, uh, new show ideas and whatever else you happen to have on your mind at oh really radio podcast at gmail dot com, or of course, we've got a voicemail number at four seven zero two 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 six seven five nine. Let's suppose O R L Y. For those of you keeping track at home on your rotary, rotary dial phones, okay. <clears throat> so before we get into um, the the main topic that I wanted to discuss on on part A here, um, Facebook came under a great deal of fire for having 
false or very um, misleading. Both, well, both misleading and very echo chambery kind of uh, news postings on people's walls. Whatever their algorithm secret sauce is, apparently they're taking steps to change it because they've been caught with their hand in the cookie jar, which is the typical modus operandi of Facebook. As soon as you're called on something, you say, no, there's nothing wrong, and then you change it uh, to avoid any litigation possibilities. So yep. at least they're nimble. They can change a lot faster than, than any other organization that I've seen so far. So eh. Just keep calling them on their on their bowl, and uh, and things will change. So, a college professor who um, I did not catch the name of, uh, and probably is going underground at this point, had created yeah. a list of sites to avoid, whether they be satirical or fake news or just terribly misleading in general. And th- she posted this in a Google Doc. And I do, I do have her name if you want it. I don't think it's necessary because, okay. uh, especially given that she they, took it down. Well, they she took it down. She's going to put it back up. She says, but according to the L.A. Times article, which had also listed the the link to the doc, all of that went away due to uh, threats and harassment, and um, but that both her and her students. And colleagues and had received. So, yeah, it's a safety measure. And that is, that's Trump land. We, we've seen just, I'm fairly certain almost all of us yeah. have not necessarily a direct friend, but a friend of a friend who has experienced some form of harassment with since, since the election. I'm well within my uh, my six degrees of Kevin Bacon on people that have that have faced harassment or other controversial um, acts in regards to their political opinions or nationality and or anything gender identity, else, gender, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Their otherness, yeah, due to their otherness, uh, and it's it's tragic. It's terrible. And I have taken to wearing the uh, wearing the safety pin because. I am actually an ally and not some crackpot that isn't actually a safe person to talk to, which I don't understand why this is controversial all of a sudden. You know, what, why, why make it a, have you noticed the big issue? The safety pin is supposed to, you know, you're supposed to wear it on your, on your sleeve or something, and it's supposed to indicate that you're a safe person to talk to, to reach out to, to avoid harassment, to, to run to if you need to. And the controversy is actually coming from both sides. I know. Which is, which is yeah. what's the most surprising. It's like, well, wh- why can't, it's like you're not allowed to wear a breast cancer ribbon. You know, in solidarity for people. There's a lot, that, that, the, the safety pin thing is a, a show unto itself. And we've got a lot to get through. But, I, I know, but it shouldn't be. No, it really shouldn't. I mean, we've had, Similar conversations more in private amongst ourselves regarding how to be an ally and who gets to decide, yeah. you know, a- allyhood and, and allyship with, you know, within these guidelines. And, yeah. you know, it's just one of those things where what I do should show, you know, whether or not I'm an ally. If what I'm doing is showing that I'm not, then by all means call me out on it. But if what I can see in the zeitgeist is, we're going to keep this as a symbol to further show our allyhood. Then why is there any outcry from other supposed allies about this? Like I get the outcry from the other side. They're going to have that outcry. They have it against everything that has to do with social justice, Mm -hmm. but not from other allies. That doesn't make any sense to me. There's a lot to unpack considering we're getting into racial issues, gender identity. It, 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 it goes on and on and on. And it shouldn't. That's the thing. It shouldn't be a to be supportive of an underserved class of people should not be a controversial thing. All stop. Who doesn't want to be supported? I I don't get it. 
So I guess. Well, if, so I guess yes. We'll talk about that next week, maybe. As, as a quick side note, I think part of it is what I see a lot, and I've seen this over years. Is you've got the, again the. Oh look, I'm an ally, and that's all they need to do is say that, and they make themselves feel good about themselves. Going, look, I'm an ally, and they leave it at that. They don't actually, sure, put skin in the game. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of the backlash could actually so be. Do, is just we've seen that over the years, and just so more do, of it. Do just, I need to put it through my skin? Is that what? It, like maybe put, just put, put it right through my neck, a little safety pin there, and that way I have skin in the game. Is is that what it needs, <laughs> needs to be? I don't get it. You know, well, it, it, at some point, yeah, you're always going to have a poser out there that's going going to, you know, play the role. I think you you should be able to spot them based on other cues. You're not only going to look for the safety pin. Well, no, and that's just it. If you look for the safety pin and they don't respond in the way yeah. someone with the safety pin is supposed to, then you're able to call them out on that. And then they yeah. are no longer a self-proclaimed ally at that point. Now – they have been determined to be false and mm-hmm. you can move on to an actual mm-hmm. ally in yeah. in the time period. It may suck because you ap- happen to find one of those people who is false when you needed someone who is not, but you're at least calling it out. So no one else has to deal with that in the future. Yeah. You know, they don't get to hide behind that anymore, which is something that I, you know, I've also kind of mentioned before. I don't understand why people would hide behind that anyway. We, you know, the not we, but the country has already shown that there are more than enough haters out there. They don't have to hide anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty obvious if the safety pin is also holding up, like, uh, you know, a Confederate flag. I think if, if it was doing that, then, you know. You, but you I got my safety pin you, on. Yeah, you definitely know where, where they stand. But, yeah, the, it, will be, it will all become rather evident uh, fairly quickly. So, hopefully, you know, choose wisely. If somebody is already in need, they're already going to be kind of picky about who they're looking for. So, and hopefully this actually just helps as opposed to hinders. But yeah, go ahead. You know, take your ball and go home. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about this uh, again because I'm sure it will come up and more stories will come out and we'll have we'll have a clearer head maybe next week. But this week, the Electoral College has come under a great deal of fire and, and controversy over... Um, Hillary winning oh, over a million more votes in the in the popular vote category. The popular vote doesn't get you elected in this country. <laughs> Only the Electoral College can get you into the White House. And people are calling for it to be removed as an unnecessary artifact of our nation's, you know, more... Um, Racist Absolutely history? racist history. Yeah, uh, th- there it is. Um, yeah, call a spade a spade. Call the spade the spade. So, but others are saying no because you know it. Uh, then otherwise, the the flyover states would then be underrepresented. They wouldn't. They would have to then be governed by basically New York City and Los Angeles, you know, as large population centers. So. My argument that, that I've been bringing up is that whenever we go nation building, because, you know, that's a hobby of America, we go around and we, we remove dictators or, or whoever might be in power in a nation and uh, we, we install our own government. And typically, because we're America, we also install a democracy, but we do not install our version of democracy. We install a one-to-one representation democracy, where one vote equals one vote, not one vote equals an elector, you know, a percentage of electoral votes within a particular county, you know, or, you know, region of whatever nation it happens to be. Well, why is that? Because we look down on other nations and they're too stupid to understand what it is the Electoral College does, since we're too stupid to understand... (laughs) What the Electoral College does. Why the hell would we put that on anyone else? Maybe well, it's just not necessary. Also, it's, it, the reason why we don't install precisely our version of government um, has a, a, a long and tangled history. Um, a good part of that is because we tried, and that didn't go so well for us. Where did we try? Uh, Where did we try? Because I'm, I'm unaware of this. I need to be educated. Um. I covered this in global perspective, but that was back in my sophomore year of college. 
but I will try and find that okay, uh, yeah, all I'll, those documents. I would be very and curious next as, time. To, as to where we actually tried our version and whether or not we really, really tried. Um, you're getting an echo. I'm very sorry. We're not getting the the echo on this side. Um, so we will continue to at least record. If you are getting it in the live feed, I'm very sorry, uh, but you can pick us up in post. I will put, I will composite the audio back together, nice and clean for everybody. Um, this is uh, just one of the things that, that we get to deal with. Uh, thank you, Skype, for you know presenting us with uh, more technological challenges as we go forward. Okay, uh, so I'm I'm sorry. Moving on. Uh, the Electoral College originally started. Uh, as part of Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3 in the Constitution, the electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. That seems weird. Um, and they shall make a list of all the persons voted for and of the number of votes for each which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. That's where it starts to like, wait, what? And if there be more than one who have such majority, okay, and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for president, and if no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, the said House shall in like manner choose the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by state, the representation from each state having one vote, a quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member of members from two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all states shall be necessary to a choice." In every case, after the choice of president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice president. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them by ballot the vice president. So, what does that mean? No, really, what does it mean? <laughs> I mean, uh, th this is of, of the time when you basically picked out of the list of people that were running. Actually, not even the people that were running. This is just the, the people that you chose. Yeah. So, you know, there was no, I'm putting my name in the hat kind of thing. It was just, I want this person for president. Hopefully, I guess. Because uh, that's not, that's not in indicated anywhere in that. So the president would be chosen. If there's a tie, then it, then it goes to the House, to the uh, Senate to decide. That's listed there. The runner-up in your list then becomes the vice president <laughs> of, you know, if they get the most votes. So the runner-up in the, in the total number of votes then becomes the VP. So that is where you could have very much the, a Republican president and a Democrat vice president of, uh, well, again, of opposing had, parties. Um, Jeff Jefferson and Burr. Thomas yep. Jefferson was president. Aaron Burr was vice president. Yeah. Now, let's see here. Uh, now, that was that was in the Constitution. And it, it was a little bit convoluted. I'll try to have all this in the, in the show notes as long as it allows me to, to present them in there. Uh, it, it may be a bit long. Otherwise, there will be a link out to the uh, Wikipedia page, and you can do, do your own deep dives on this. This is just the text. Now, the Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution was proposed by Congress on December 9th, 1803, and was ratified June 15th, 1804, by uh, the requisite three-fourths of state legislators. And this is, this is now 
the Electoral College that we have. This is the system that we have in place now. So it is not as the framers intended. So don't let people misguide you in thinking that, uh, that they're the ones that came up with the idea. They might have had a little bit of hand in, in the modification later on if they were old enough, if they didn't already die. Um, but at this point, they changed it in 1804. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. I'm not sure what that's, that clause means. Basically, um, you know, it, it was in the other, like, um, like the original pe- clause as well. Two people from the same state can't run together? Right. So basically what it would be is if we were in the Electoral College and there were two people running from Florida, we can't pick them both. We have to pick, you know, from different areas so that we're essentially not giving Florida some kind of federal balance tipping point, right. you know, with a president and a vice president from the state. So if I was to run for president, I could choose nobody in this chat Nope. as my VP running mate. I would have to choose somebody that lived outside of Florida. According to this. Correct. Yes. Okay. So that's that's clear. Okay. Um, let's see. Where was I? Oh, yes. Uh... And actually, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not necessarily true. Because it says the electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. So that's just that the electoral college cannot place the vote. You can pick someone from Florida, but the Florida Electoral College would have to pick a different VP for you than who you had chosen. So you could run with Stephen, but if I was in the Electoral College, I couldn't vote for both of you as president, vice president. I could vote for you as president and then someone in yeah, but Ohio they, as vice president. Yeah, but, but that effectively negates it because we would in, – in this version of the Electoral College, we run on the same ticket. But it only in, negates it in this in that one particular state. It doesn't negate it in any other state because if you're both from Florida, the elector the the electors in the other states have no issue voting for you. You have 49 other states in which you wouldn't have that problem. Oh, that's interesting. So if you're a, if you're one of the states that only has three electors, you could technically get away with that and basically throw away those three that you're not going to get. Yeah, one way or another. That's that's that's, that's interesting. It's never happened. Ah. I don't think. In doing a nice side dive here, mm-hmm. finding out why we have the Twelfth Amendment, it's actually for the the reason of the Jefferson Burr election that we have the Twelfth Amendment. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's precisely because of that election. Hmm. Because they didn't get along very well. I mean, they well, shot him in the original <laughs> thing. We actually had a both got equal votes. In the original electoral college, equal votes, and there was a lot of backroom negotiation stalemate uh, going on during uh, that election. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was an incredibly messy process that, in the eyes of many, widely discredited the original electoral college rules. Um, and so the, the 12th amendment started rolling into view after that election. Okay. All right. Continuing on with the text so that we can, we can mosey along here. Uh, they shall name in their ballots, the person voted for as president and in distinct ballots, the person voted for as vice president, and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president and all persons voted for as vice president, and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate. So still, all that structure is all the same. Um, The president of the Senate shall, in the presence of the the Senate and House representatives, open all the certificates and... Oh, jeez. Yes, of course. Which, once we got to, you know... 300 million in population, that's kind of gone away a little bit as an untenable prospect. That can't be done. Um, 
The person having the greatest number of votes for president shall be president, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if no person shall, uh, if no person have such majority, then the person, then from the persons having the highest numbers, not exceeding three on the list, is this the holy hand grenade of Antioch? The counting of the number shall be three and not, shall not exceed three. <laughs> um, of those voted for as president, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately by ballot the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from Two-thirds of the states and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. And if the House of Representatives shall not choose a president whenever the right of choice shall devolve upon them, well, that's a great word, devolve upon them, before the fourth day of March next following, then the vice president shall act as president, as in the case of the death or other constitutional disability of the president. This is much more detailed. Yeah. Having, you know, grown up a little bit as a nation, we knew, knew a few more things, you know, like duels with the president and things like that. Uh, the, pres the person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be the vice president, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, if no such no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the vice president. A quorum for the purpose shall consist of two-thirds of the whole number of senators, and a majority of the whole numbers shall be necessary to a choice. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of president shall be eligible to that of vice president of the United States. So that also sets aside the rule that the vice president must meet the exact same requirements for office as the president of the United States. So I guess somewhere along the lines, you could have, you know, ignored that <laughs> or it would have, you know, a vice president been chosen that was uh, not of the proper age or distinction or, you know, of birth, etc. So good of them to, to iron that out. So, that is the Electoral College. That's what they've uh, set aside. That's the law. Now, in practice, why do we have the thing? There's a number of, of theorized reasons. Um, one of them being that the South, uh, especially early in our, our nation's history, mm -hmm was afraid of the, the populous northern states and the, the uh, to try and put it in a historical reference, the tyranny of northern states <laughs> yeah. would would decide the president and and thus we had the electoral college. I mean let let's look at history here. I mean three fifths compromise was a thing because how we parse out electoral votes is well electors is based upon census data and well slaves not being people back in those days mm -hmm. even hurt the south with the electoral Always college and thus the three-fifths compromise pardon me i had a rogue tab uh, now, also, I just wanted to point out that in 1804, until 1817, no, yeah, 1817, there were only 17 states. So we have we have certainly grown up as a nation. You know, at the time of the writing of this, we had an odd number of states. <coughs> so, so th things of. Uh, of ties, though they did put in there that ties would be handled by the uh, the Senate uh, president of the Senate. Um, and just a reminder: the president of the Senate is also the vice president of the United States. Just a you know point of order there. So it'd be the 
the outgoing VP of the United States would actually decide in that case in a manner, yeah, would decide who the president was going to be. Or would they? No, they'd be, no, the the House, as stated there, I'm sorry, the House determines who's who's going to be the president, but the Senate determines who's going to be the vice president. Yes. Come on, direct democracy. We can do this now. <laughs> yeah, but again, part of the reason also the, the, the framers did the Electoral College was fear of an ignorant electorate and that these electors would be insiders mm-hmm. and would use their best judgment to decide upon a president. I mean, they could go completely against the people who were running. It was just, it had to be a name. And these guys could pick amongst their own elites the president, regardless of outcome of vote. Yeah. Of course, also, at the time, um, let's say that there is a, there's a note somewhere on why we have elections on Tuesdays. And it was so that carts and buggies could actually make the trip. And so that people could then get back, you know, to their farms and homesteads in enough time to do whatever they normally needed to do. Typically, like, attend church services on Sunday. Things like that. Wow. Yeah. So, that's why we have elections on Tuesdays. Which, again, is a complete throwback and an anachronism and not something that we need to do anymore. Oh. Of because course, I'm all for making election day a holiday. Yeah, absolutely. Or at least a weekend. A weekend day. I mean, there, yes, there's a lot of people out there, of course, that work on weekends. So an, a national holiday would be better. But, again, people still work on holidays, too. So one way or the other, well, absentee again, I, ballots are fantastic people. <laughs> absentee ballots are good. Early voting, in my opinion, is even better. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm all for having Election Day be a national holiday in hopes of nothing else but to have a higher voting ter- voter turnout so our executive and our representatives or represent the will of the people as opposed to the will of half the people. Well, that would also in- involve an engaged populace. But, again, it's easier to get to the polls when you're not having to try and squeeze it out on a half-hour lunch break. Oh, absolutely. I concur completely. Now, we've got nations like, I don't know, Australia, where voting is compulsory. Huh. You must vote. Or pay a fine. Everyone in the country does. That's interesting. Yeah. So this is not without precedent in the world. So you would think the United States being one of, if not the most technologically advanced nation in the world, would be able to rectify these little things and give proper representation to all of the citizens. Yeah, but it's not in the It's not in the best interest of the political elites. Also, yeah, since we brought up Australia nervous. and compulsory voting, looking it up. Yep. Uh, for people who are going to freak out, oh my god, people are going to be fined into oblivion for not being able to vote. Um, it's not much at all. Australia, it is a $20 penalty. It's not terrible. So, the price of going out to eat is the price you pay for not voting. Yeah. 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 You, you you pay essentially a day's worth of food if you're eating on the cheap. Pretty much. So, okay. Well, if we were to do something like that here, I think we would need to have the fine be a little bit higher. Like, not wallet breaking, but more than $20. Because you're going to have a lot of people who are like, oh, okay, I'll just pay 20 bucks." Yeah, but at the same time, I see that as a means of getting a lot of revenue to the government for people <laughs> being lazy jackasses. That's that is a possibility. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 all all for this because hey, you want to be lazy, pay us. Yeah, yeah, it's fine to be lazy. 
To to quote our president elect, more money for the government to misappropriate. That's what, <laughs> that's why he doesn't pay taxes. Yeah, the, the the government that he's going to be misappropriating the funds for now. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's do a yeah, quick bit of math here. Yeah, there's that. Um, oh, oh, Steve's crunching numbers. <laughs> oh, for the 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 population that didn't vote. Okay, yes, if, if yeah, the population didn't bucks. vote, if they all were required to then pay a twenty dollar fine. One point nine billion dollars. Holy mother! <laughs> oh, oh, because oh. ninety six point nine million people that were eligible did not vote. I'm all for this. Twenty bucks sounds reasonable. Yeah, and one point nine billion sounds like infrastructure. Well, no, that's a bridge. Well, well no, what what this would do? Uh, because you know, let's let's th- think how we would phrase this. How would we put this into government? And the way that a fine for not voting would go with it was it would then go into the the fund for elections, the election hmm. fund, which which when you're um, yeah, I think it's when you when you like renew your license or something like that, you, you can you know put some money in for elections or uh, something like that, and and that would that would be the money that would go to any candidate. And it would not be dark money. It would remove other political interests from getting people elected. Well, again, I was in speaking with Steve the other night. I had this harebrained idea. Fund. Let me look that. Hi, um, I'm, I'm I'm all for corporations being seen as citizens. I just want to cap how much any citizen can give to a political candidate at five thousand dollars. I think it's, isn't it less than that? No, because Citizens United changed that. Yeah, yeah. They they the had speech. unlimited speech. Yeah, due to Citizens United. I want to bodily limit speech because, in my opinion, cash is not speech. Um, and cap it at five thousand. Expenditure limits. There is a general election funding. Uh, presidential nominee of each major party may become eligible for a public grant of twenty million dollars plus a cost of living adjustment for campaigning in the general election. To be eligible to receive the public funds, the candidate must limit spending to the amount of the grant and may not accept private contributions for the campaign. Private contributions may, however, be accepted for a special account maintained exclusively to pay for legal and accounting expenses associated with complying with the campaign finance law. These legal and accounting expenses are not subject to the expenditure limit. In addition, candidates may spend up to $50,000 of their own personal funds. Such spending does not count against the expenditure limit. Minor party oh. candidates and new party candidates may become eligible for partial public funding of their general election campaigns. A minor party candidate is the nominee of a party whose candidate received between 5 and 25% of the total popular vote in the preceding presidential election. So this would go with the libertarians, I believe. A new party candidate is the nominee of a party that is neither a major party nor a minor party. The amount of public funding to which a minor party candidate is entitled is based on the ratio of the party's popular vote in the preceding presidential election to the average popular vote of the two major party candidates in that election. Interesting. A and new, this is why nobody actually this, takes the public money because it's not nearly enough. It's not, but you know, if you're, <laughs> yeah, but if you're running as one of the major party candidates, you could be eligible for twenty million dollars in funding. Yeah, but that's not nearly. It's enough not to run enough. No, it's not enough. But you know, if depending on how you do it, you could manage to to get there. Because there's there's still PAC money. Because those aren't associated with the campaign. They are individual entities that are campaigning on the behalf of someone else. Yeah, but it's actually far easier, and, and it, both from a legal standpoint and just from a life standpoint, to not take the public money, not take the public entanglement, and just do it all privately. 
Yeah, it is. But twenty million dollars. Twenty million dollars is a drop in the bucket. I know. Which makes me think that there we're, we're spending way too much on elections. Um, but considering how much dark money goes into it now, and there's practically unlimited spending. Yeah. Because unlimited speech. Because money's speech. I, are, I still don't know how my speech. There were, let's see, to see the presidential spending limits for 2016, general election limit was 90, $96.14 million. Overall primary it, limit was $48.7 million. According to the Washington Post, the money raised as of October 19th between the two campaigns. Trump was $795 million. Hillary was one point three billion. Whoa! Drop in bucket. Yeah, but that's these are presidential spending limits. This is out at uh, fec.gov. The presidential spending limits for 2016, the Federal Election Commission. So the numbers coming in are are a bit weird. So we got to, we yeah. got some some commentary from from the chat room that I don't want don't want to miss here. Uh, so yeah, when when we were talking about the uh, requirements for VP, yes, that's what keeps Schwarzenegger from being vice president, and uh, and preventing the uh, demolition man scenario from the uh, Schwarzenegger presidential library or from ever coming true. Uh, voted in three elections now, at least two. Had okay days off from work. Yep, and let's see. Yeah. Work at, oh, 12 hour days. Ey. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can actually, uh, maybe get some, uh, some government people in there that will actually at least post, at least try to put a bill through to make it, make election day a holiday. But with, uh, uh with voter suppression we've... and gerrymandering and all these things, and of course, you know, money being speech. It's also, don't forget the other bills that are trying to be passed and suggested now. There's a lot of them. That's another show. Awful lot of yeah. them. Yeah. So, elections are a mess here in the United States. And they were a mess before Trump. Oh, yeah. Way before Trump. Oh, he is no, just it, merely it's been the, a messy history. Yeah, he's merely Ever. the most recent indication that things need to be changed. Uh, on the side of the positive when it comes to things like the Electoral College, though, yeah. let me throw this down. One of the major advantages we have with the Electoral College at this point is it is, regardless of what a lot of the media out there try to say, especially the alt-right media and a lot of the demigods try to say about election rigging and how they get rigged, with the Electoral College the way it is, it is damn near impossible to actually rig the presidential election True. because you are not rigging – one election that affects everything because every state handles it differently, plus you've got the primary, so you have to rig 51 separate elections. Yeah, but that's that's not the Electoral College. That's simply the way the votes are tallied because mm -hmm. because there are so many votes and because it has to be a state issue, then the states still have to collect the votes one way or the other. And the way they do the polling, the way – well, the way they do the ballots and the way they do the, the vote-taking – um, that alone is up to the states to do, regardless of whether or not it feeds into an electoral system or not, because we do it also the same way for senators, for congressmen, and there there's no electoral system for them. This is only for the president. Mm -hmm. Which, but president, and makes president, it, the only ones that are across state, stop across state boundaries as well. True. True. Everything else is inside state. Yes. Yeah. They're the only they're the only national office that, that we actually get to get to choose. And we have chosen. We the people have spoken, or at least a small percentage of us has spoken for the rest of yep. us. So there you have it. But that was part of the reason for the original Electoral College, so that if e the electors voted their conscience and go if this guy has absolutely no qualifications here, let me write in somebody else. Well, he 
doesn't have any qualifications, but they're not going to write in anyone else. He has zero public service experience. He has zero military experience. Yes, I know. He went to a military school for a little bit. That doesn't count. Count. That does not count. Um, he, he simply doesn't know. We have currently a sitting president that realizes this and is going to be tutoring him. Because Trump did not realize what this job actually takes and maintains. The fact that, and as someone who's a political scientist, this made me just, my head explode. The fact that he didn't realize that the White House staff don't stick around when an administration changes. Nor apparently. You know, a thing he could have learned by watching yeah. West two episodes of the West Wing. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he should have had Aaron Sorkin be, be one of his political advisors. <laughs> there's that. There's also... Uh, one of the things where he actually may get in trouble constitutionally pretty much right after election day. Uh, well, after inauguration, shortly yeah. thereafter, is in our constitution, the, the, the president-elect must be willing to relocate. Yeah, and he wants to he wants to do double duty. He wants to still live in Trump Tower yeah. in New York. You ca- must be willing to relocate. You gotta you can't live just in the treat this as a nine to five job Monday through Friday, and yeah, no, I, I I go home for the weekends. You can't do that. No, you can't split. You residence. legally cannot do that. You can vacation somewhere, but that's a vacation. That's not a residence. You, you have, have to, to be willing. It's, you need you to change be- your driver's license. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, yanked out of bed at three o'clock in the morning because pick a crisis somewhere in the world. Yeah. You, you know, have to be you able be ready to, for all that kind of crap. Yeah. What happens when you have to address the nation because yeah. of some sort of crisis that has happened? We can't just have everything rigged remotely. The systems and infrastructure are already in place at the White House for this. Well, there's a reason you relocate to the White House. Yeah. Now, technically, yes, the. The orders of state and and the way that you govern can be relocated because that's just a line of communication. Now, the bunker under the White House and things like that, those those are there. Y- you can't do anything about that. I mean, yeah, the infrastructure yeah. has already been built up yeah. and invested in there. Yeah. I, I, the, the house comes with the job. You have to take the house. Yeah. Uh, you Mama don't Van, get to just uh, go, nah. Yeah. Mama Van, uh, Carson did uh, decide that he was not going to take the posting because, believe it or not, he must have woken up from whatever ambient-induced slumber that he had and realized that he was not qualified to run a department. Uh, coming, from to, the man, to close. coming from the man that was trying to be the president of all of the departments. <laughs> to be close to the quote, um, yeah, go for it. He did. He did not want to, due to lack of experience, um, cause a presidential crisis for running one of these departments into the ground. That's okay. Trump will do a enough job of that by himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the smartest thing that that man had ever said. He 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 became. He he, 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 woke up. he had a moment of self realization. Um, <laughs> now, there is no starker contrast here between the candidates that were in 2016 than simply the experience level. You have someone with zero, zero experience in anything except being a game show host, basically, and real estate mogul. I'll I'll give him the title mogul because that that fits. Well, no, you know, he he has experience of being wealthy. Yes. That's his experience. He has that experience. Silver spoons and all. And then you have somebody that actually lived in the White House experiencing the day-to-day operations of the highest seat of power in the nation for 8 years. <laughs> Plus you, you- being the Secretary of State. 
<laughs> there the was senator for New York. There was uh, has been in political systems no in this country how you since she was it. in her twenties. Yeah, she no knew matter the ins how and outs. She knew the ups and downs. No matter how you slice it, there was no one that was on any ticket that had more governmental experience and knowing just knowing the job than Hillary Clinton. Period. End of story. I mean, it's it, it's a fact. And the funny thing is, a lot of people who voted for Trump yeah. voted for him in the hopes of prosecuting Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And he's already backpedaled on that one. Of course. Because what will Obama do on his last days in office? He's going to write out a whole bunch of pardons. But how do you pardon someone who hasn't been prosecuted yet? Because Sorry, you sorry. can. You can? Preemptively you can. pardon can. somebody? Yes, you can. I need as long as they have been accused of the crime. You can't and pre-pardon before accusal of crime. But once they've well, been accused of something... Actually, you, you can. You can. It, it, I didn't even say legally accused. No, no, it has to be something known of. Yeah, true. And it can be known of by the president. It doesn't have to be known anywhere else. It doesn't state that. Does it, it have to specifically spell it out in the pardon, though? I don't think it does. And if uh, it does, it doesn't matter because it's already done and it's right, a pardon it's, it's and it pardons. can't be charged. So a, a president is, can technically pardon themselves, though it's never been done. And they can pardon people for crimes that are not known about by anyone else. So this is... The United States way of it, – it is the license to kill, basically, you know, on Her Majesty's Secret Service kind of thing. Quite literally, the president could say, I need you to go do something deplorable, and I will just pardon you immediately. In fact, I'm going to write out the pardon right now because I know you're about to commit this crime for me. And it'll just be waiting here in this stack. And it will just be waiting, and it will be done. I'm so uncomfortable right now. No, and it's. I, go ahead, look it up. How do the pardons Fact work check in terms of executive orders? Like a pardon is not an executive order. Okay, so it can't be contradicted by the incoming no. president like an executive order. Can. A pardon no. can be tried by the Supreme Court and overrule overturned there. Okay, so that wouldn't happen until after he had happen. his appointment in. It, it, it well, won't happen. He, well, you got to look at who he's got. Gone, nah. He's yeah. backpedaled, but he's already picked someone in Jeff Sessions who is thoroughly anti-Hillary and who has said multiple times he has no faith in Comey and mm-hmm. he wants to look more into both the emails and the pay-to-play um, Clinton Foundation issues. So mm-hmm. the president may not go after her, but that's not going to stop Jeff Sessions from doing so. That's a valid point. Yeah. Now, but if... If President Obama decides to pardon Hillary Clinton, I think it does have to be specified for what. So, basically, uh, for her damn emails. <laughs> you know, just done. Because we're sick and tired of hearing about her damn emails pardoned. Thank you, Bernie. You know, yeah, I mean, that could, that could be it. Now... However, uh, he could certainly continue to investigate the Clinton Foundation because that would also be Bill. Yeah, which they hate even more. But it also doesn't matter because a foundation is a separate legal entity. They're still off the hook. Mm-hmm. I mean, that all of this is just continuing the witch hunt. A witch hunt that's, that's been in place since the early 90s. Yeah, th- it's just going to cost the government more money. This is not yeah. something that we should do. The well, they're fa- going to. The Clinton Foundation is continuing to do good work. They're actually a 501c3. You can look it up in all of their filings, what they're doing, where the money is going. <sighs> so, yeah, it's... It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Okay. So, that was the Electoral College. Uh, it really serves very little purpose other than the, the thought right now that it allows 
underpopulated and possibly underrepresented states, even though states are represented by their populations. That's how we get the 538 number. And actually, most of those underpopulated states are overpopulated via representation in the Electoral College, taking away electoral votes from bigger states like Correct. Florida. Yes, Florida loses an elector. Yes. And that number then goes to one of the states that would only get one electoral vote. <laughs> And they have uh, to have a minimum of three. Yep. Based on population, they might only have one. Yeah. But so they have to have places a like California, of three. Texas, and Florida, Florida. New York, and uh, us. Pennsylvania. Yeah. We get to lose electors in so, favor to subsidize like Alaska, Wyoming. Wyoming. So technically, yeah. the bane of everyone's election night existence. Uh, Florida, who everyone loves to complain about, we are the underrepresented state Correct. when it comes to the Electoral College. And real quick, because we were talking about numbers earlier, um, and we had discussed like the, the presidential spending limit for this campaign yeah. was like $96 million. I think you said like 95. Uh, I still have it up. It was $96.14 million for the general election. And Stephen said that she actually raised $1.3 billion. Yeah. So yep. that that's a difference of... Uh, you know, one point two billion dollars. She <laughs> yeah. could have paid every electoral college member one million dollars and still had over seven hundred million dollars for herself after this election. Jeez Louise! But that's bribery. I mean, she's crooked. Why not? Well, actually, I, I don't. I think that the price for elector would probably be higher because most of them are millionaires already. She could pay each one two million and still have over two hundred million dollars left for herself. After the fact, yeah, because two the million two million is a very nice vacation. Two million would still only be only just over one billion dollars. <sighs> that uncomfortable feelings back. So while Stephen has a and point in that speech. it's supposed to make it not riggable, <laughs> technically, if your president uh, candidate is is raising one point three billion dollars, anything's possible. And the electors are known. There's a list of them. Yep, they're already no. known. It's like the people that vote for the Emmys. The they, they're on they're the already role known for for each of the major parties. They have their yeah. own roles. Yeah. For electors, and they don't change year to year either. Uh, of them. Often they, they do not. They can, yeah. but they there don't. are some that are 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 changed when uh, an individual dies. Uh, is <laughs> well, not not just dies, but maybe. Um, is ill has a, a series of family emergencies. They may step down. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's only it's more on the elector as opposed to the party for them to step down. Right. And each individual state may have other restrictions and laws uh, around the behavior of the elector. Yes. Uh, and which almost... it is up to each state to, to determine that. So, again, this would be an, an even deeper dive into how things are run. And, and we've already we touched on that and on some with uh, with the previous episodes about how elections are, are run and uh, you know yeah because almost every yeah. one of those states does have a clause that if they happen to go against what the vote determined that they would lose their position in subsequent years right yeah it's like oh no 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 naughty naughty you didn't do as we wanted you to do which kind of defeats the purpose of having an individual in that role in the first place doesn't it yeah if they don't have the autonomy to do what they want to do, then it's a moot point. The party has already decided. And in some, in some states, they are bound by law to vote the way the party wants them to anyway. There, However, are, there are other states that don't have that. So again, it's a state to state to state to state thing. And you're going to have to look up your own state constitutions to figure out how that is, is done. However, the penalty typically for being a, as the term is, faithless elector, yes, um, typically isn't that high given the people that we're dealing with. It might be like, you know, okay, you get fined a thousand dollars. Okay, that's okay you know, because some, Hillary gave me. Some are willing to pay that. Yeah, Hillary gave me two million back there, so it's okay. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter. I'll yeah, a lot of a lot of states also have a a jail sentence as well. But there's never there are no known instances of anyone who has ever been determined a faithless elector actually yeah. being hit with that sentence. So. No, because that's that's again that's petty. That's just petty retribution right there. 
So I think that is going to wrap it for the Electoral College. I think that uh, we're all now experts in this. So, you know, tell your <laughs> friends. Go ahead. You know, we, we uh, I will, you know, give out honorary Wikipedia degrees to everyone for uh, <laughs> for setting through this session. And, um, yeah, so now we're on to uh, on to bigger and better things in Episode B.